So, thank you for having me, first of all, and a very warm welcome to everybody who's here. About 10 minutes ago, there were just a few people, and now the hall has kind of sprung to life with so many different people of all kinds of ages. And it strikes me that there must be a lot of wisdom in here, because even those of you who look younger than me um, have come to a retreat called Dying and Death, and liberating perspectives on those. Maybe it's the fact that liberating perspectives was part of the theme that, uh, that brought you here. But um, this theme is very deep, and in a sense it's um, pointing to the most important questions we have in life, life and death, right? This is, um, and we're somewhere in between right now, we're hopefully more alive than dead, but um, the trajectory is very clear. You know, our bodies age, they start to wear out. Um, diseases that we, uh, we have along the way. I know that for me, when I got sick in Asia, during my many years living in India and Burma, I used to think, well, you know, I'll get better soon. And sometimes we do get better, but sometimes those sicknesses just continue and become more and more chronic as time goes by. So it's not always the case that we can, you know, perk back up and continue kind of with the same energy that we had before. And of course, this is very difficult. And especially if we haven't contemplated these basic facts of life, it can be quite challenging and confronting to find ourselves, you know, slowly aging, um, getting sick. And of course, our loved ones also, as we age, start to pass away. You know, the older we are, the older our friends and family tend to become. And at some point in our lives, it's inevitable that we'll have to experience loss and bereavement and um, hopefully have something to turn towards to help us face that. But really, the best uh, preparation for that is to start reflecting on these themes right now. And this is what we're here to do today. And I'll give a few reflections, probably more than I anticipate, on the theme. But also, I want us to have some time together to talk about um, our relationship to dying and death and perhaps some of the things we can, ways that we can prepare our minds to, uh, to develop an emotional resilience and even a sense of compassion and acceptance, a sense of inner peace around these things. So um, it's probably going to be quite a rich day and I guess one invitation I'd like to make straight away is that if this is very... Um, distressing or at any time really emotional for you, if you feel um, that perhaps you heard enough about this theme, then please look after yourself, you know, go outside, just lie in the grass, as long as it's not pouring with rain, I think the weather's going to be pretty nice today, and just take the time that you need to process whatever we're working with, and always remember that metta practice is not only uh, cultivating an emotion, but it's also a way we can respond to difficult feelings that can arise, yeah? So we can always um, hold whatever sadness or fear or grief perhaps arises for us, any difficult emotions that we might have around the facts of death and impermanence with a sense of compassion to ourselves, compassion to those emotions, understanding that, you know, as we open our hearts to them, then um, our minds can really contain more joy eventually, right? Grief and compassion and gratitude go hand in hand. They're not opposites. They're actually um, connected. And the more we can open to um, the more difficult feelings, the more difficult realities of life, the more hopefully our hearts can um, be also be open to compassion and to living more fully in this world. So uh, with that in mind, everything is offered here as an invitation. You don't have to follow the schedule to the T. Well, you probably will follow it to the T and the coffee, but, you know, you know <laughs> people never miss their lunch and their cups of tea. Um, but you are welcome to miss any meditation sessions or talks or whatever, if that feels uh, best for you at that time. So the Buddha actually talked about death contemplation as one of the four rakitas, which means protections for the mind. And it's interesting that um, the other three, or at least two of the other three, seem quite different at first. The first one is metta, metta meditation. 
And the next one is uh, contemplating the qualities of the Buddha, his awakening, his peace, his compassion and wisdom. And then reflections on the unattractive nature of the body, which might sound a bit kind of uh, gloomy, but just to give us a sense of balance towards what this body is. And then the fourth one is contemplations on death. And whenever the Buddha taught, he always taught with the end of suffering in mind. So he prescribed these practices as protections that bring comfort and ease to our minds when we consider and reflect upon them for a long time. And yet, in our death-averse cultures, <laughs> where death is so hidden from us, even the dying process is, is really hidden from the time people become you know, too frail to cope, we put them off into the nursing homes or you know, behind closed doors, and we keep a lot of the um, difficult um, experiences of later life hidden from most of our eyes. So you know, it is a death-averse culture, and that means that uh, the idea that thinking about death can be comforting is really the last thing on our mind. We, we kind of think it's the opposite. Just today I was coming uh, by taxi from our new monastery, which I'll talk about more later. <laughs> it's on a hill just outside of Oxford, so it's a, a really beautiful forest monastery. We've, we've kind of managed to make that step. And uh, I said to the taxi driver, yeah, I'm going into Bristol to teach on death and dying today. Um, he said, oh, right. He said, I'm a Catholic. I said, oh, right. Do you have that kind of contemplation? He said, maybe, but I don't really do it myself. He said, you know, for me, it's just something that will happen later. When it comes, it comes. <laughs> but, you know, when we have that kind of uh, perspective, it's much more confronting when it does arise because we just haven't taken the time to consider our relationship to life, really. Right? And it's in remembering that whatever we have right now, however healthy we might be, you know, all our friends are around us, we've got this beautiful new monastery, everything's blooming, springtime, you know, whatever, um, things are going to end. All of this is impermanent. All of this is um, really not under our control. And the more we reflect like this, the more we can really value the people around us, we can value our health, we can value those we love, and we can take the care to see that we treat them well. You know, one of the things that is frightening about another person dying or our own mortality is wondering if we'll have any regrets, right? Wondering if there'll be things that we didn't say that we should have said, or things that we did say that we'd rather not have said. <laughs> And that's quite normal, we have our regrets, but you know, we can always do our best right now to express our care, express our gratitude, our love, and to apologize where it's possible, to say, I'm doing my best, I'm not perfect, but you know, I'm trying my best and please let me know how I can improve. And for anyone who has recently perhaps lost a loved person or uh, maybe didn't, make that closure as perfect as it might sound in the books. It never is in real life, right? Still, we can talk to them in our heart. We can talk to these people that we love, that perhaps we feel we've lost, and we can still express our gratitude. Our lives can become vehicles to express our gratitude through embodying some of the qualities those other people maybe showed to us, maybe shared with us, um, mm -hmm. what those people meant to us. So dying and death is also contained in the Buddha's first noble truth. You know, the, one of the causes, the root cause, one of the root causes for suffering is actually birth. When we're born, we have to age, we have to get sick, we have to die. And you might be thinking, well, why is she telling me this? This is really obvious, isn't it? But the Buddha said that this has to be understood. It has to be fully understood. And it's through not understanding these things that we suffer. So again, it's about, about turning toward, you know, with a lot of um, gentleness, perhaps a sense of curiosity, open-heartedness, um, and courage as well. It takes courage to turn to face suffering yeah, and to look at its cause. 
Um, and in a way, you know, the Buddha's own life was an example of this. His father was a, a small king of that particular um, part of India where he lived. And he did his best to protect the Buddha from uh, even seeing, coming into contact with sickness and death. So he basically had all the sensual pleasures on hand, you know, kind of entertainments, a whole um, harem, is that how you call it? Harem, I don't know, of women, uh, maybe if you're gay, men, or, you know, whatever would entice the Buddha and keep him basically caught up in the realm of the senses and stop him thinking about these things. And at some point he got really fed up and he wanted to see more of life. And so he left the palace against his father's wishes. And the first people he came in contact with were a sick person, an old person and a dead person. And also a recluse, someone who had left the world, the householder's life. You can't actually leave the world, by the way, as a monastic, you still live very much within the world. Um, but it's one of the motivations for renouncing and living the life of what we call a samana, a renunciate, is to resolve this issue of life and death, to understand it and to somehow transcend, to find something deeper than death, to find something that goes beyond dying and death. And this was what motivated the Buddha himself to renounce. And there's a really lovely little um, <clears throat> sutta, and I, I don't know where it is. I read it in a book by Bhikkhu Analia recently. But there was a king in the time of the Buddha, and he made the very pertinent point that the last thing people want to talk about is old age, sickness, and death. This is something we avoid at any cost. And the Buddha agreed with that. <clears throat> but then he also made the point that if there were not these three things, if there were not old age, sickness, and death, the Buddha would, Buddhas, because there's more than one Buddha, Buddhas would not appear in the world and people would not come to know the teachings. But it's because there is old age, sickness and death that Buddhas arise in the world and that the teachings become available. So this shows that one of the Buddha's motivations was to help people resolve this um, issue of constant birth and death. And this can be done in this very life. You know, we can actually experience meditative states that take us beyond the body, beyond this five sense world, and give us a clue about what perhaps awaits us at the end of this life, or perhaps when the body disappears, when the body dies. And I want to talk more about that in the afternoon, but there's some very interesting stories about um, people who've had near-death experiences where... Um, basically the body and the senses shut down and it's as though the mind kind of separates from the body and becomes extremely radiant and bright. And I'll talk more about it in the afternoon, but three quarters of the people who have these experiences become convinced that there is an afterlife. However they conceptualize that, whether they relate that to a heaven realm or um, in Buddhism we'd say that's still impermanent, it's still in existence, it's still not the end. But one of the markers of this, one of the qualities, is that there's an immense amount of peace and a feeling of complete unconditional love. And by realizing this, people lose their fear of death. They actually realize that death is not uh, something to fear. It's a profoundly beautiful experience that gives them great meaning. And because these people are fortunate enough, of course, to come back and talk about it and continue their life, it actually changes them for the better. And this is another thing that reflection on death can do. You know, yes, it's there. And, you know, it's inevitable. It's not something we can avoid. But by learning to relate and respond to this and to live more in line with reality, you know, with impermanence, with the fact that we cannot control these bodies, we cannot control other people's bodies, we cannot have that our loved ones stay by our side. Um, because of this, we can develop a lot of compassion and a feeling, again, of much more meaning and value in the way that we live. Our priorities change, right? If you had only a month or, let's say, a year to live, how would your priorities change? Would they change? It's a question that we can ask. And um, I think around 2019, probably 
I don't know if I'd been to Bristol Insight before or after that. Um, but I was diagnosed with a melanoma on my arm. You can see my really cool scar. It's like mm-hmm. tough forest non-scar, because they always talk about tough forest monks, right? So my arm's kind of like sliced. <laughs> I don't know if they needed to make it that big, but um, <laughs> I had this really strange mole for years, actually, probably since childhood. I call it my ghosty because it looked like a ghost. And um, I'd kind of accepted it, so I wasn't too concerned. But um, I remember my mother coming over one time and one of my best friends, and they said, I don't remember it being quite that big. I was like, really? Okay. Maybe I'll get it checked out at some point in the future, of course. And uh, while the same best friend was with me, it actually started to change. I noticed it on a train journey uh, to a Dhamma talk, actually. And I noticed it started to crust and bleed and look very black. It was really freaky because it's like, I mean, cancer inside the body, we can't necessarily see it. We don't necessarily know it's there. But here it was like visibly changing in front of my eyes. And I said, oh, dear, I better check, you know, go and check it out. And um, they took one look and said, we're sure it's a melanoma. We'll do the test, but we're pretty sure. And uh, the lady in the clinic was amazing. I had to get back to Oxford on a train. And by the time I got back, it would have been six o'clock in the evening after she went home for work. And she said, I'm going to stay until you get back to Oxford. I'm going to do overtime, basically, so I can give you the news, which was very touching. Um, And I took it pretty well. Uh, But then I had the weekend to think about it. And I realized, "Uh uh-oh, you know, I looked into the Internet. (laughs) Apparently they say don't do this, but I always want to know. And it said if it's been growing for more than six weeks, it could be incurable and then the prognosis is five years. And it's like, hmm, this has been growing for years. <laughs> and I had the weekend to kind of let that sink in. And of course, you try not to catastrophize, right? This is the relationship we can have when we contemplate death. We can go into catastrophe mode or we can go into kind of avoidance, denial, etc. So we need to find that middle place. So I did my best to find that middle place of acceptance and openness to whatever might come. And I noticed these feelings in my body would switch from a kind of out of the blue, not not precipitated by a thought. Suddenly I'd be going about my business and the sort of guttural, how do you say, like visceral memory that I had this thing on my arm would arise and I'd just get this shaking through my body like kind of very fine trembling, like, ooh, and I'd have to just sort of stand or sit where I was and allow it to kind of flow through. And the interesting thing was, it was almost, um, what's the word? Like, I'm a bit tired today, so my brain's not uh, very flexible. But it was back to back, let's say, it would fluctuate with a feeling of complete love. And, you know, the next few days I saw, started to see people after the weekend and, and uh, you know, uh, wait for the appointment to get it removed. Uh, and whoever I would see, I would just feel this enormous sense of love, like really beautiful, soft, unconditional love. And I realized, I asked myself, you know, if I did only have less than five years, would I change things? And I thought, yeah, of course I would. You know, before this happened, I thought, of course I would. I work too hard. I'd do much more meditation. But actually, when it happened, I realized, no, I'm living an exquisite life. What a strange word, right? Life can be exquisite. I just had this vision of my life and how I'd always tried to cultivate the Dhamma as best I could and, you know, traveled around the world looking for opportunities to serve. And I just had this kind of big picture perspective that somehow it had been, it was a very incredible life to live and an incredible opportunity to serve. And I realized actually I wouldn't change very much. If I only had a few years, I might do it in a more relaxed way. You know, I might not kind of fret about the small things so much, but essentially I would still um, be very happy and find a lot of meaning in what I was doing. And that gave a new sense of depth and meaning and purpose to my life of course as you know I've had this scar for a while now so uh, it's fine (laughs) I think this year is my fifth year and that's when they say like you know it's unlikely to come back but the point is it can come at any time the rest of your body can be fine 
and one little tiny thing on your arm or wherever it might be. And that's it. Same with an accident, right? We can die in so many different ways. Um, you can also say that poverty, of course, war, are obvious causes of death, um, all kinds of diseases. But the Buddha basically pointed to birth being the, the, the cause. And this is a great equalizer, isn't it? You know, he says, and this is from the Diginikaya, there's a little quote, the Buddha says, with birth as condition, there is aging and death. If there were absolutely, utterly no birth of any kind in any realm, whether gods, spirits, demons, humans, four-legged creatures, winged creatures or reptiles, if no birth of beings in any state, beings born into any state, if there were none of those, would aging and death be discerned? No. Therefore, birth is the cause, the origin, the source, and the condition for aging and death. So really, this is what we can expect. And I think a reflection on death is not only facing up to the fact of our mortality, but also learning to turn towards the fear. It's often the fear of what we um, think we will lose that is the hardest thing to reconcile. And this involves, you know, learning to work with our emotions. The way we learn to work with emotions of all different kinds, you know, according to the Buddha's teachings. Using our mindfulness and adding that kindness and compassion to the way that we're aware. In other words, looking at our relationship to the idea of dying and death and putting the uh, emphasis there. When there's some things that are inevitable in life, you know, and it's the resistance to those inevitabilities, the, the wishing it to be different that causes the most suffering, the most upset. You know, we're in, we're in um, a war with reality. We're fighting, wanting it to be different, and it's this that is the problem. You know, our attachment to how we want things to be. And, of course, life it doesn't go that way. There's another beautiful story in uh, the suttas uh, that the Buddha uses to teach one of the bhikkhunis, one of the fully ordained nuns who was trained under him in the, at that time, um, how to deal with the death of her child. And her name was Kisa Gotami. She was known for wearing very coarse rag robes, and she was apparently very lean, very skinny, and uh, not particularly attractive. I don't know whether that mattered. I think that was of concern in relationship to her family, her in-laws, who, you know, wanted her to um, have a child, and she was also unable to have a child for many, many years. So she got a lot of bullying and lived quite a miserable life. And after a number of years of trying to conceive, she actually managed to um, conceive and give birth to a baby boy. Uh, but unfortunately, perhaps due to the poverty or you know, maybe the beatings that she took, that little child died after just a few months. And she went out of her mind with grief. And she'd heard about the Buddha. She uh, decided to go and pay him a visit, and she took this dead child in her arms and said, you know, please, you're you, know, you have supernatural powers, you're wise, you're compassionate, do something to make my child come back to life. And surprisingly, the Buddha actually said, okay, I'll help you, I'll do something. And she said, oh my goodness, wonderful, thank you, thank you. Paid respect at his feet. And he said, okay, but you have to go to every house in the village and ask for some mustard seed. In some sort of, it says sesame seed, whatever, the small little seeds. And it was something that everybody had, everybody used to cook with. So he said, okay, go to every house and ask for this seed or this, uh, this little... Um, seed and he said but you have to go to a house where nobody has died and she didn't get it at this point but she said yes 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 I'll do that I'll go to to these houses and I'll bring back the seed so she went to the first house they said yeah sure you can take a whole bag of seeds but then she'd ask has anyone died in this house and the Buddha said yeah the people so he said yeah you know my mother's died or my brothers died, my cousins died, my grandparents have died. People of all different ages die, right? And she went from house to house to house for the whole day, searching desperately for some household where no one had died. And by the end of the day, she'd come to her senses a little bit and realized that there's nobody, 
you know, who, who doesn't have to go through grief. There's no household where somebody hasn't died. And it's this that the Buddha's teaching with right view. It's not just understanding that, you know, I will die or that my friend will die or that I suffer, others suffer. It's understanding that this is universal. This is something we all experience um, without exception. And it's that that widens the heart to the predicament that we're in. And it allows us to connect with other people. And, you know, because the malady, in a sense, is universal, the solution has to be universal. So when the Buddha teaches the Dhamma, it's a Dhamma that's applicable to all. And I think this is also incredibly comforting to know that other people also die, other people also experience grief. Um, I've heard that there's something in England, perhaps worldwide, called the Death Cafe, where people can go and sit and talk about this and meet other people who've also lost a loved one or who've received a difficult diagnosis that they're finding difficult to bear and feel more connected, know that they're, you know, you're in the same boat as everybody else, whether you're young, whether you're healthy, whether you're old, whether you're sick, anything can happen, you know. I heard a story, well, there's, it's very well known in Perth, uh, of a lady who now serves as the centre manager for a big uh, meditation retreat centre um, with Ajahn Brahm as the main teacher there. And many, many years ago, she had a daughter who'd been on a pilgrimage to India. She got back from that pilgrimage and very inspired and went dancing that night. She was 21 years old. And in the middle of dancing... She just dropped dead on the floor. It was a massive heart attack. No one could see it coming, you know. She was in the prime of life. And I'm sure that her mother went through a lot of despair. It was so difficult to reconcile if we haven't been able to say goodbye properly, especially, and when it's a shock. But um, she has transformed her life, you know. Now she cares for all the retreatants coming along and uh, has found her meaning in the Dhamma. It might be interesting and reassuring to know that even in the Buddha's day, his um, dear attendant, the Venerable Ananda, who was actually a stream winner, so I don't know how many stream winners are here today, uh, but this person had already seen uh, the truth of suffering at quite a deep level, yet then he lost his preceptor, another monk called Sariputta. And when his preceptor died, he said it was as though the whole world kind of went black. You know, he felt dizzy. He couldn't really think straight. He was in so much grief because he loved his preceptor so much. And he went to the Buddha to tell him this. And the Buddha said, but Venerable Ananda, when Sariputta died, did he take away your virtue? No, he didn't take my virtue away. Did he take away your, your stillness, your um, serenity, your calm? Well, maybe for that moment, but it's not been taken away for good. And did he take away your wisdom, you know, that you no longer see? He said, no, he didn't take that away. And then furthermore, I think this is in the parallel suttas. Um, he said... Uh, did he take away the aggregate of liberation? This means basically the teachings of the Buddha, the potential for people to awaken. Did he take that away from the world? No, that still remains. And in this way, you know, the Venerable Ananda managed to reflect and realize that although he's lost his beloved preceptor who inspired him so much and encouraged him on the path, still the path is within. And the Buddha used to say, make an island of yourself. You know, you have the capacity to awaken to these truths. No one else can do that for you. You have everything it takes. Whether you're, you know, you think you're particularly virtuous or intelligent or, I don't know, able-bodied or whatever gender, whatever race, sexual orientation you may have, whatever you think about yourself, the fact is you're a human being with the capacity to understand and that's why the Buddha taught. He knew that we can understand these truths. And it's up to us to develop virtue in our lives. So I think reflecting on death and our own mortality can really help us to live our best lives and to reflect on the goodness in our hearts at any given time. You know, we're not enlightened yet, but we all have a lot of good qualities. And the Buddha encouraged us to bring those up 
to reflect every day on things that you've done that have helped other people or, you know, even things that you've abstained from doing, like saying something unkind. Um, you know, the fact that other people value and love you, this should mean a lot. There are qualities that we have inside and it's important to bring them up. There's another lovely uh, verse in the Dhammapada where the Buddha talks about the importance of living well. He actually says it's better if one were to live a single day virtuous and meditative. So this is your day, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Than to live a hundred years bereft of virtue, uncomposed in mind. Better to live a single day so really what this means is that the tragedy is not in death itself, not even in living a short life. The tragedy is a life that's not well lived. You know, it's wasting our lives as human beings, not reflecting, not taking the time to reflect on whatever we have that's precious in life. And again, to, you know, say goodbye to people in a beautiful way every day when you leave your house, if you're leaving a partner or a child, Tell them you love them, you know, wish them a wonderful day. Tell them how much they mean to you, if you possibly can. I have a best friend from childhood, very, very fortunate. We grew up together. And some people might think familiarity breeds kind of a sort of um, carelessness. You know, she's my friend, she'll be my friend, whatever I do or say. And actually, we find it's not that way. You know, whenever we even write an email of any length other than, you know, see you soon, <laughs> when we're about to meet up, we often express how fortunate we feel to have a best friend who's, you know, been there throughout our life. And really valuing this while it's there is a protection for that loss, against that loss. <clears throat> it's not that it makes us cling more. It actually helps us to take it in, to take in that goodness and um, uplift our minds. And of course, lastly, before we do some meditation, because uh, all of this subject is very rich, reflecting on our own mortality, recognizing, as the Buddha says, all that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. This is a reflection that he asked the monastic community to do again and again, every day, you know, to reflect in this way, all that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. This reflection enables us to live more closely in alignment to change, to the fact that everything arises and passes away. You know, our very life, our body is conditioned you know, the opportunities we have come about through multiple causes, through many other people that have uh, helped to bring them together, to bring them about. And this is the time to practice. It brings a sense of immediacy to our meditation, to our practice, to our lives. We just can't afford to wait for later. And we can apply this understanding of impermanence to whatever we experience in our bodies and minds. You know, whether it is grief that's arising or fear around... Um, ill health and the limitations that might have for our lives. Whatever's arising, we can, if we can just ask ourselves, you know, can I allow this feeling to be there? Can I allow it to change and to dissipate? If we stay present long enough, you know, with uh, compassion, with curiosity, mm -hmm. with a lot of gentleness, if we can just stay present to even the most uncomfortable of feelings, we give them a chance to, in a way, teach us their true nature, right? Their nature of change. And also develop a compassionate response by softening around it, by allowing them sometimes to break our hearts open, trusting that that's going to uh, develop so much more compassion within and so much more ability to stay present for others who are going through their own struggles too. We need to do our own work first before we can really be present for others and support them in their process of um, whether it's grief or whether it's their own dying process, which we'll talk more about this afternoon. So um, just allowing ourselves to open to the difficult, but always with this sense of compassion, loving kindness to help us overcome the fear 
is an important part of death contemplation and recognizing that, you know, it can happen at any time. When uh, the monks went to the Buddha to talk about how they practice death contemplation, he admonished them a little bit. One of them said, well, you know, I reflect that this could be my last day. He said, no, 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 that's not good enough. The next one was like, well, I reflect that I could die this afternoon. I said, no, no, that's not correct either. And someone else said, well, I reflect that I could die in the next breath. He said, yes, this is the kind of death contemplation I praise. Another one said, I reflect that I could die, you know, at the end of the meal. Not, not good enough. And another one said, I reflect that I could die. This could be the last morsel that I eat. He said, yes, this is the kind of death contemplation that I praise. So we can have this contemplation as an ongoing inquiry in our lives. You know, we can remind ourselves that we're going to lose whatever we have. And in a sense, it's the clinging. It's not the love we have in our lives that causes suffering, but it's the clinging and it's the resistance to that change that causes the struggle. It's the fear of, of death that's more difficult than death itself. Perhaps death can be a very beautiful thing. Who knows? Has anyone here died or remembered their death? It would be interesting to know that if anyone here has maybe had near-death experiences or come close. I remember I did once have a dream, and it's only a dream, but it was interesting and it was a bit um, scary. I was actually being killed in the dream, and I knew that. I was lying down. And somehow in that dream, it seemed so real that I experienced how it might be to leave the body and kind of see the whole thing from above. And at that moment, I was free from pain. It was almost like a mental movement of the mind in the dream to avoid that pain, because sometimes in my dreams, I can experience things as though they're very real. And I did separate out from the body. And it gave me a sense of, oh, perhaps that's what the mind will naturally do when I die. You know, and people talk about that. They're in accidents, for example. I read years and years ago about someone who was in an accident in Nepal where they were being chased by a rhino. And the rhino actually mauled them to a degree. Firstly, though, the adrenaline kicked in and they were able to run really fast and actually start an ascent into a tree, even though they didn't know how to climb trees. But still, they were um, harmed as well and had some stomach injuries and leg injuries. But they managed to kind of somehow switch away, <laughs> I guess it's the adrenaline that kicks in as a survival mechanism, so that they didn't feel the pain for quite a long time. You know, that, there was a kind of protection there, and I think it might be similar in the time of death. So anyway, we have these different means and um, many ways to work, and we can contemplate in different ways. And I think, again, all of you are wise in being here at a, a theme like this and just to see how we can uh, come to a more realistic idea about life and make the best out of the life that we have right now. So um, I think that's enough for now. And uh, I would like to invite you to stretch out your body, your limbs a little bit. And uh, when you're ready and relaxed, we can do some meditation. So just really asking your body what you can do to bring more comfort and ease. and respecting your body's needs. And perhaps beginning with a sense of gratitude towards your own body. Acknowledging that 
you may have aches or pains, perhaps some chronic disease that leaves you feeling tired or under par, not able maybe to do the things you used to do as you age. Perhaps you have some old injury that means you need to sit on a chair or perhaps adjust your posture during this meditation session. Just accepting and respecting your body, however it manifests right now. Noticing the ways that it does serve you you're mobile and well enough to be here today. So just gently connecting with your own body and any feelings you experience, perhaps beginning at the top of your head. And taking this opportunity to extend feelings, attitudes of gratitude towards your body, allowing it to relax. Recognizing inside your head is your brain, how hard that brain works in your job, navigating so many decisions, being competent, efficient, allowing you to make a livelihood. And just for this meditation, for this day perhaps, together, allowing your brain to relax as though all those little electric circuits are slowly dimming, quietening down. So all you need to do is receive whatever experience is happening right now without thinking about it, without trying to figure anything out. Noticing your brow Perhaps feelings of tension or tightness around the brow and just allowing any holding, any muscular tension to relax. Noticing your eyes with a feeling of gratitude for bringing you the gift of sight. And allowing those tired eyes to relax. Deep in their sockets. Eyes gently shut. Sensing any feelings around your nose and your mouth.
giving you the gift of smell and taste, enabling you to breathe, to speak. Speak words of kindness that heal and bring harmony to those around you. Bringing your awareness to your ears. Perhaps you still hear clearly, or perhaps you struggle to hear. Having a sense of gratitude. For how your ears work to allow you to learn. to hear the Dhamma, to listen to a friend, And continuing to allow your awareness infused with the feelings of gratitude to flow through your neck, which includes your vocal cords, allowing you to speak, to your shoulders, sometimes holding so much tension for you and giving your shoulders permission to relax. Mentally sending them your gratitude. Feeling into your arms, your elbows, all the way down to your hands, your fingers and fingertips, which are so sensitive. Allowing you to pick things up put them down, hold a cup of tea or coffee if you prefer, to write a lovely card, or a presentation, to give someone a hug. Just giving thanks to your arms, to your hands, as you notice all the different sensations you experience there. And noticing any feelings in your chest area. From 
from the top of your chest down around your ribs to your belly the whole front of the trunk where so many organs are keeping you alive perhaps you notice your lungs your diaphragm moving extending with your in-breath relaxing with the out-breath each breath happening now different from the last breath different to the next breath there's only one breath happening right now offering your lungs, your breath, your heart all your internal organs a sense of gratitude for how they work to keep you alive just accepting them for what they are maybe you have gastric trouble a weak heart maybe your breath is not always smooth or enjoyable but it's good enough to keep you alive right now to give you the opportunity to really enjoy a single moment of breath and feeling into your back noticing any feelings at the top of the back all the way down to your buttocks your hips Sensing into your spinal cord, which sends so many signals from your brain to the rest of your body. And just mentally imagining those signals becoming calmer, more relaxed. as you give your body, your nervous system, a rest the rest that it deserves
Noticing the feelings in your buttocks. Offering them your gratitude for enabling you to sit. Perhaps comfortably, perhaps less comfortably, but good enough. Allowing you to meditate in the sitting posture. Just opening to whatever feelings arise, maybe pressure, heaviness, pulsing, heat. No sensation the same as the next. Constantly changing. Constantly passing away. Feeling into your thighs. All those big muscles that allow you to stand, to bend your legs, to walk. Hold so much of your weight. Noticing the feelings that arise and pass away and allowing them to relax. Noticing feelings in your knees. If they're really painful right now, just seeing if you can ease them off by adjusting your knees or maybe softening your awareness around any tension, any mild pain. And regard your knees with an attitude of gratefulness. Knowing you may not always have good knees. They may already be showing signs of wear and tear. But for now, they help you do so much. So treating them with respect. And moving down your legs, your shins, your calves, to your ankles and feet, to your toes. These amazing feet. That allow us to walk, to connect with the earth. To hold our weight. All the little tendons, ligaments and bones. And regarding your feet with gratitude, with care.
And just opening your awareness to include any sensations anywhere in your body. Perhaps of a sense of the whole body sitting here now. Not the same body as 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Not even the same body as five minutes ago. A second ago. All the sensations constantly changing. Always in a flux, in a flow. just like guests in a guest house. Some feelings will be pleasant, some unpleasant, and other feelings will be somewhere in between. Just allow them to come in to the guest house that is your body. And allow them in their own time to go. And if your mind needs an anchor to help it come more deeply into this present moment, then see if you notice your breath. Just being aware of this breath without any thought of the next breath or the breath that's just passed. Giving all your energy, all your attention, all your gratitude and love to a single breath. The breath that's coming in the breath that's going out. Recognizing one day this breath will be your last. You can't afford to miss this breath. and to take this opportunity to care.
And if you find your mind wanders, starts thinking or going off into the future or the past, let that moment go, it's finished. And just reconnect with this moment in whatever way feels good to you. Perhaps reconnecting with the feelings in your body. Noticing how again they've changed. Or reconnecting with this breath. The only breath you'll ever have. with no concern for the future or the past.
So in meditation generally, but uh, also on a retreat like this, see if you can maintain some continuity, even as you open your eyes, perhaps just returning to the breath whenever you remember, not worrying if you've missed 50,000 breaths, you can still be with this one now. So there's always an opportunity to connect to the present and to make good karma in this present moment too. So now is the opportunity to change your posture, your meditation posture. You can continue sitting, of course, or move to a chair. There are more chairs if you find, oh, these people were smarter, they got a chair, I was too late. There's still a lot of chairs. So you can, uh, I don't mind if you come here also or just uh, make another ring. Or you can lie down on this comfy part of the mat. Or you can do some walking meditation. So this is a really beautiful school because there's lots of green space. There's even some swings. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the trick with walking meditation, the main kind of uh, uh, guideline other than not walking near the neighbor's houses, is to choose a length, uh, like a path of maybe between 10 and 15 steps. Try not to cross anyone else's path. Sometimes people go in all kinds of directions and you might be walking across someone else's little stretch. So if possible, if there's a limited space, see if you can sort of have paths that are kind of parallel to each other, but you might find you've got plenty of space. And uh, you basically begin where you are and stand and just establish what I call kindfulness. It's actually Ajahn Brahm's um, favorite word for mindfulness co-joined with kindness and I think it's such a, a genius word so we are mindful we're in the present moment but we're also looking at our attitude so we're being kind we're keeping our mind soft and receptive and perhaps allowing your attention to kind of um, sink into the feet you know so you're really grounded in your body and aware of your feet especially as you start to move. So you're basically going to take uh, some steps. So you'll be walking from one end of the path to the other, but a little bit slower than you might normally walk, just so you can maintain that uh, awareness. Um, see if you can choose a pace that's fairly natural. So it's slow, but it's not tight or tense. Sometimes people get into a race to see who can go the slowest and everyone's walking really stiff and you might find that the tension just creeps into your body but you do have the end of the path so again you can uh, just check in with yourself uh, relax enjoy standing for a couple of moments and then again start walking back and the point here is not to get anywhere it's not to be here and then to get to the other end of the path but it's rather to arrive with every step so in the same way that in meditation we try to be present to the breath, here you can be present to the feelings in your feet and to just see if you can maintain your awareness of a single step, one at a time, so that you're aware of the foot arising, lifting off the ground and the different changing sensations, the sensations as it moves and the sensations as your foot comes back to touch the ground. If it's safe enough and if you want to, you can use bare feet, you feel much more. And you'll feel the weight as it shifts and you'll also feel perhaps the grass if you're walking barefoot. So it's very grounding and immediate as a practice. And um, yeah, just to be aware that it's a blessing to be able to take a step and that one day will be our last step. If you want to do some really full power death meditation, mm -hmm. <laughs> while you're walking you can you can and this was recommended to a monk in Australia and he thought yeah yeah that sounds pretty straightforward you just repeat the words with one step I will die the next step that's for sure hmm. I will die that's for sure I think in Thai it's just two words but I like to say something like we'll die for sure we'll die for sure something like this and this monk was doing it you know pretty chill I will die, that's for sure. I know this, right? 
But I think he was doing it for quite some time and at some point he just got this visceral fear coming up. So this is something that can happen when we really do, when the message starts to sink in. Um, on a little day retreat like this, I would advise you to go gently. If uh, fear does start to rise, maybe take a seat, do some metta practice, not to make it go away, but just to have a nice wide soft container for that fear to arise in a way that's not too overwhelming for you. So maybe that's unlikely, I don't know. But the thing is we never know. So see if you can keep your awareness in the present moment and just be receptive uh, with a curious attitude to whatever arises in your mind and body. Is that okay? Anything uh, unclear or any questions so far? We're all good? Great. So we can keep going into the silence. Yes, Alison. Um, can I just add that people who, I encourage people who are watching up to, to come early to lunch. Yes. So that they get priority. Great. And enjoy eating their lunch. Okay. So yeah, if um, you are washing up, you can come, say, 10 minutes five minutes, maybe five minutes early, because I think the lunch um, put out of people will be 10 minutes, so maybe five to 12. And if the other people can just be sensitive to the fact that others might want to go ahead. So if people do go ahead, you know why. And that gives those who need to go ahead permission. Okay. And uh, so there'll be a bell rung at a 12. Is that right? Or five to 12. And... Uh, the rest don't need to hurry to lunch, so you can, you know, you've got plenty of time. And then there'll be another bell at about five to one, something like that, before the afternoon meditation. Okay? So I'll see you again around then. <laughs>